Living Hope Assembly of God. We're going to preach the last week of our series. I, I'm, I'm thinking last week. It's a setup for last, the last week of it. Uh, we've had a four-week series, three weeks so far, and we wanted it to be a four-week series. And I feel like it has been very meaningful, at least to me, and I pray that it's been that way for you. Um, the title of the series that we've been preaching is called There Is a Way. There is a way. And week one, we talked about there is the way of self. Week two, we talked about there is the way of others. And week three, we talked about there is the way of religion. The way of religion. Now, the, the three that we just mentioned, we, we really don't want to adhere to those three. Uh, the one we're going to talk about this morning is uh, the way of God. There is a way. It's the way of God. And this morning, if you're there, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, it says, Enter at the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who are going through it. Because small is the gate and narrow is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, be glorified. Speak to our hearts today, God. I just pray, Lord, that you would say something that would be life transforming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At first glance, the, the word narrow brings a sense of special privilege or access for those who are trying to enter into God's kingdom. It almost sounds like a casting of lots, a drawing of straws to enter. But those statements couldn't be any farther from the truth. In fact, 2 Peter 3 and 9 says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It is God's desire and God's plan since the beginning that the whole of humanity be saved and that the whole of humanity come to know him. But we, we who, are, who are alive and been alive for a long period of time now or some time, we understand that not everybody desires to walk with God. Not everybody will walk with God. And, and it's, very, it's a very unfortunate thing, and, and it's really a sad thing that we have had such a great salvation made available to and for us but we fail to walk in the way that God would have us to walk and do what he would have us to do. Earlier in this same chapter, Jesus told his listeners, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. And the truth of the matter is, if we come out of desperation, if we come out of need, if we come realizing that, man, we are messed up and we are in need of a Savior, listen, he is not going to deny you his spirit. Are you following me this morning? It may not feel like it, and I want to let you know today, it's not always about a feeling. It's about a knowing. In fact, when we come to know Jesus, you, you might not necessarily feel anything at that moment at all. Or you may feel something in that moment. moment. You may be moved with emotions. Listen, more than a feeling, it's a way of life. More than a feeling, it's a knowing, it's a belief, it's a trust, it's a leaning to more than you're leaning to anything else in the world. He made it clear. The path to eternal life is open to everyone who asks. Even though Jesus is not hard to find, 
But the gate to heaven is narrow in the sense of having a precise requirement for entrance. And I want to let you know today that that, that precise, that, 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 that element that we need, and this element is the only thing that we need, and that element is Christ. He is the only way that we can get to heaven. There is no other way that we can get there apart from Christ. John 14 and 6 says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. In some translations, it says, except by me, through me or by me. Jesus said, there is no other way. You're either going to go through me or you're not going at all. The Pharisees in Jesus' day had a hard time with that. They had, to, they had the Savior, the Messiah, right under their nose. But they still rejected him. They still didn't accept him. And if I were to be honest today, many of us, we still have the same problem. We have deliverance right under our nose, but we refuse to pick it up. We have, we have salvation right under our nose, but we refuse to pick it up. I believe that salvation is an is a umbrella-type word. There are many things throughout life that we need Christ to deliver us from and save us from. In one of those things we learn, we need Christ to save us from ourselves. We need Christ to save us from others. We need Christ to save us out of a religious mindset. Are you following me today? The wide gate is non-exclusive. It allows for human effort, and all of the religions of the world to be a part of it. And it's almost like we as the church, we're standing off to ourselves. And the world is looking at us, and the world is saying, who do you think you are, you goody two goody two shoes? Who do you think you are to exclude all of us? We're just like you. You're no different from us. The only thing that makes us drastically different is that we serve one God. And his name is Jesus Christ. We don't have to wonder about his name. His name is Yahweh. He is the God of heaven, the creator of all things. He is the sustainer of life. He is the bread of life. He is the rose of Sharon. He is everything that you need. Listen, I am a former drug addict, drug dealing, gang banging thug. When I wake up in the morning, I have a choice to either trust the way of Charles or trust the way of God. And every time I trust the way of God and I find success in that path, can I tell you today, if you're new on the journey, trust Jesus. If you're old on the journey, trust Jesus. You're not going to be successful apart from him. Jesus is the only way. Billy Graham was asked once, what makes Christianity different from all other religions. Dr. Graham said, the difference between the religions you've been studying and Christianity can be summarized in two words, Jesus Christ. He is the center and foundation of the Christian faith. And he also is the reason why Christianity is different from all other religions that people follow. Billy Graham goes on to say, let me explain it this way. All the religions you've been studying, and have, they have one thing in common. They all are searching for God. Even if they don't call him God, or they think there may be many gods or goddesses. They do this in a multitude of ways but they're all trying to find God and gain his favor by their sacrifices and good deeds. But Christianity is different. Instead of searching for God, God is searching for us. Instead of reaching up to God, God is reaching down to us. This is why Jesus is so important, because he came down from heaven to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. He came down to bring God to us. 
God is perfect and holy, and we are separated from, from him by our sins. No matter how hard we try, we cannot erase the stain of sin by ourselves. But by his death and resurrection, Christ did for us. Billy Graham goes on to say, I sense that down inside you are searching for God. But God is also searching for you. By faith, turn to Jesus and receive him into your life. And this is God's promise to you. That's powerful. The other religions, they teach some crazy, nonsensical stuff. If you cook a really good meal and if you leave it in the middle of the night, that the, that the God will come and eat the meal. If the God eats the meal, you found favor in the God's sight. Or get some totem pole and you stand on it for as long as you can. And if you can stand on it long enough, you might please the gods. Nonsense. The Bible is clear. It's not by works lest any man should boast. It's a trust in Jesus Christ. And when Paul said that, it was not in, uh, in, in contradiction to what James has said. When James said that you want to talk about faith, you say you got faith, well, show me your works. What James is saying is that out of a pure heart and pure motives, a believer's life will be transformed by the Spirit. And out of that life, the transformation by the Spirit will come naturally good deeds. John 10, 7 through 10, Jesus said of himself, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the, of, of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pastures. I want to stop there for a moment. What Jesus is saying, they will go in and out, meaning you will always be safe in every area, everywhere you go, because the Spirit of God is going with you, and he's leading you, and he's guiding you, and he's protecting you, and he's teaching you how to live a life that is pleasing to God. The thief does not come except, Jesus said, to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus said that I came that you may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus just didn't come to give you life. But man, trusting and walking with Jesus gives us an abundant life. Are you following me? The, the world, the enemy of our soul wants us to think when we look at Hollywood, when we look at society, the enemy of our soul wants us to think that we are missing out on something, but you're missing out on nothing. You have everything that you need pertaining to godliness, and it is found in Jesus Christ. Listen, when you have the Spirit of God inside of you, that's what sustains you. You don't need anything else. When the world is turning against you, you have Christ. Listen, that's how the Apostle Paul was able to maintain and be sustained while inside of a prison. That's why he was able to say to his converts, Listen, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. He said that from a prison cell. If it were one of us, we probably would say something like this. Be sad and be mad. And again, I say be sad and be mad. <laughs> when am I getting out of this prison? Man, somebody needs to come put something, some commissary or something. You say you to church, put something on my tab so I can go buy some ramen noodles or something. Are you following me? No, but Paul said, listen, my being in prison here is for the furtherment of the gospel. The apostle Paul understood that no matter what state he was going to be in, he was going to bring glory to God. I wonder if we lived our lives like that, what would happen? For the believer, no matter what state we in, we're in, God has created a path through Christ that leads to joy, peace, and love. 
that can only come through the Spirit. You wonder why we preach about the Spirit so much. Because we need the Spirit. The Spirit of God will always lead you to Christ. Christ led us to the Father. The Spirit leads us to Christ. And all three of them are unified. The triune nature of God. There's a little lady at one of the facilities I minister at, and she tickles me every time because she said, you know, Chaplain Starks, she said, I want you to go pray for some, some one of her friends. And she said, I know that uh, you're praying, you're going to pray to the triune God. It's powerful. Every time she say that, it's like, a, it's like a jolt in my spirit every time she says that. Because it's the, it's the, the, the person of God, the, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they are unified. It's the Godhead. It's the Godhead body. It makes up who God is. Do you understand what I'm saying today? In other religions, you you have to earn your salvation. But in Christianity, God gives you freely of his salvation. Don Stamps, author of the Fire Bible, says this passage teaches that those who enter God's kingdom through Jesus will be saved. There's no might. Man, Jesus is bad to the bone. He's he's God. Listen, who's who's gonna stand? And throw in his plan. Who's, who dares to oppose Jesus and, 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 and win? Nobody. Listen, the sheepfold will have a gate. This is what Jesus is saying. And every shepherd from around the area would put their sheep in the sheepfold. And they would leave and they would go out and adventure around and look at the land around them and, 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 and looking, looking for safe passages and whatnot. And then they would come back and get their sheep, and, and they would come to the sheepfold, the, the entrance to the sheep gate, and they would call, their, they would call, they had this little special call, and out of all of those sheep, they would do that little special call, and their sheep would come run into them. Jesus said that I am the gate, I am the, 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 the one who stands there, what also the shepherds would do when, when night would fall, they would lay at the entrance of the gate so that no wolves and no predators could get in. And, and kill the sheep. Jesus is saying, I, I'm that. I am your protection. I am your shield. I am your buckler. I am everything that you need. And when you are in me and I am in you, there's nothing that is impossible. You're protected. That means you're secure in his salvation. I'm preaching this morning because the church needs to hear it, that there's nothing greater than his name and there's nothing greater than his authority. When you're going through the toughest times in life, you need to call on the name of Jesus. Don Stamps says, those who choose not to go the way of God will receive from God eternal consequences for their sin and rebellion. I've been down that path. I'm dead serious. I've been down that path. I remember, and I think I shared it before. I remember one time my mom, I I was in, because I grew up um, in church most of my life, and I rebelled a few times. But I remember this one time my mom, she made a statement. We were standing in my kitchen. My kitchen is my mom's kitchen. (laughs) I didn't have a kitchen. I was too lazy. Live with mom, that's okay. I guess if somebody lives with mom, that's okay. But I, uh, I just wasn't at that place in life. And I, have, I wasn't established like I wanted to be yet. And I remember I, uh, I mean, my mom walked in the kitchen. She said, Red, that's my nickname. She said, uh, are you still serving God? She could tell. Probably smell like Saturday night drunk. She said, are you still living for God? I said, no, Mom, I'm, I kinda, I've gotten out of church now. And uh, I gave her my reason. Can't really remember what my reason was. But I'll never forget the statement that she made next, like, shook me. She said, Red, God is going to get you. She didn't say the devil's going to get you. But she said, God is going to get you. And it's like something, res- I didn't understand it, but it was like something resonated in my spirit. And I carried that with me for the next several years. 
Like, man, you know, it's one thing to say that the devil is going to get you, but it's a whole other thing to say God's going to get you. Man. It's your sin, your rebellion. It's what separates you from God. And I just want to throw another nugget in there for a moment. I'm going to slow it down just for a moment. We'll yell again probably somewhere down the road. Even if you're born again, don't get it twisted. Even if you're born again in love with Jesus, if you keep sinning, it's not like you're drawn close to God in your sin. If you keep sinning, this is God. This is you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I would fear no evil. God is moving. God is expecting obedience. But when you consistently disobey God, you, de- you, you detach your hand from his. And he's moving. He's moving throughout the valley. And now he's going to go to the next hill. Because you chose to walk in rebellion, you're down in the valley. And you wonder why life is going so messed up for you. You wonder why your decisions are opposite of God. You wonder why you can't find stability. You wonder why your days are more confused than you walking in clarity. You you wonder why you can't get on fire for God. Maybe it's not God, maybe it's you. Maybe the Bible says those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, that is a progression moving in the way of God. They shall be filled. You can't move towards God if you're not reading your Bible. You can't move towards God if you're not praying and talking to him. You can't move towards God, and I want to make two statements. You cannot move towards God if you don't love him. You can't move towards God if you don't love others. Are you following me this morning? You can't have one without the other. However, those who go the way of God will receive eternal life and never-ending personal relationship with Jesus. Never-ending. Can you get your head around that? Never ending. You're talking about joy and peace? It's a passive all understanding. There's no, there's, there's perfection in his presence. We, we just, we feel tidbits of who God is. Can you imagine one of these days for eternity being in the presence of God? It's amazing. A faith in Jesus is being all in or not in at all. A faith in Jesus is being all in or not in at all. I'm going to say it again. A faith in Jesus is being all in or not in at all. There's no in between. You can't say that you're going to Omaha if you're traveling towards Tacoma. It doesn't make sense. You can't say you're living for God if your life is not producing the fruit. You can't say you're living for God if there's no desire to love your neighbor. You can't say you're living for God if there's no desire to love your enemy. You can't say you're living for God if there's no desire. Put put something in that blank spot for me. There's no in-between. There is no gray area that leads to God. There's only one way that leads to God, and that is through Christ. Jesus says in Matthew 6 and 24, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And I want to take that, erase that word money out of there. You can put any God there. See, a lot of us, we stop there and say, that's just talking about money, Pastor. I'm free. (laughs) It's all good. No, it's not. Whatever, is strugg- whatever your struggle is in your life, you either are struggling with it or you have succumbed to it. And when you succumb to it, that thing has become your God, whatever it may be. We talked about it this morning, whatever it may be. For some of us, man, isn't it crazy that we can get comfortable with bitterness Somebody once said that bitterness is like drinking poison and wishing the other person dies. 
or forgiveness, unforgiveness. Some of us, man, that has become our God. We talked about it for the last few weeks. Self has become people's God. Others have become their God. And religion has become many people's God. The problem with the narrow gate for many is that it is too tough for some to travel. It is a road of sacrifice and surrender. It's a road of sacrifice and surrender. You can't get there no other way unless you are willing to make the sacrifice. You can't get there no other way unless you are willing to surrender. And if someone who has made the sacrifice has already surrendered, I understand that it's a life choice, it's a life decision that you have to wake up every single morning and choose to follow God. But you need to wake up every single morning and choose to follow God. It's a lifestyle. It's who we are. We, it's not a box that we pick up on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights, but it is a lifestyle. Get rid of the box and say, this is who I am. This road is where one must be willing to lay down his or her self-will and pick up the will of the Lord. And this is key. And carry your cross. Put down your self-will. We all have a self-will. There are things that we desire, and I know that he would give us the desires of our heart, but it's when your heart lines up with what he is desiring. What is God desiring for your life? One of the things that God is desiring for each and every one of us is to consume us. The Bible says that our God is a consuming fire. Listen, if God is living inside of each, and I know that is a figurative way of saying it, but if God is living inside of each and every one of us, and if we're following the way of God, listen, your life will be transformed, and eventually the things that you're struggling with, the hang-ups that you have, the inconsistencies that we have, the, the apathy that we have at times pertaining to the things of God will be transformed by his spirit. Can I get an amen? That's one amen that I've asked for all day. I'm getting better. Amen. Sacrifice. Surrender. Or in my new word, surrenderance. Got another one, sisterings. You don't have brethren, why not sisterings? The cross. The cross. The cross. Pick up your cross. Pick up your cross, sacrifice, surrender. Pick up your cross. You cannot carry a cross and carry your selfish nature at the same time. A cross is total denial of oneself. You cannot do it. It's an impossibility. It's like water and oil. They do not mix. This is a paradox where dying to self equals life in Christ. The road to God is a road to death, spiritually speaking, spiritual death. You, you, you have not truly lived, church, until you have lived for God. I, I promise you, you can't tell me anything in this area. I don't care from the richest to the poorest. You have not lived until you lived for God. And the only way we're going to live for God, if we're willing to get on the path that God is on and travel with him down this path. But listen, not very many want to do that. Not very many is going to trust him in that way because there are some things that some of us are holding on to that we refuse to let go of. And God is saying today, let those things go and follow me. This entire series has been about letting go of self, letting go of others, letting go of religion, and picking up God and traveling with him along the way of life's journey. Sold out. Sold out for Jesus. Listen, a person who is sold out for God can endure a little offense every now and then. A person who is sold out for God can endure a little lack every now and then. If you're not willing to do that, you might not be willing to travel with God. Yeah. 
Romans 8 and 13 says, for if you live, for if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the sinful nature, you will live. There's a side of us that has to die. Are you following me, church? You remember back in the day where you had, you wore suits to church, you would find your best suit, black tie, white shirt, black suit, casket sharp, ready to go to church. It's time that we spiritually get our black suit, black tie, white shirt ready because there has to be a funeral in your life. We have to die to self in order to live for God. The way of God is often not a road that is filled with worldly success and possessions, but it is a road that would take us through the hardships and difficult decisions. I have to talk about my own life for a moment. I thank God that I surrendered to God. I thank God that the day that he said, Charles, I want you to go to seminary, and he gave me a list of reasons why he wanted me to do that. I am so glad because it was following God where I I found my beautiful wife. It's because of God, following God is where I I have my beautiful family and I have a wonderful church that I pastor and I have a wonderful job in the community out there in the surrounding area where I get a chance to minister to people all the time. And I jokingly say, but I am so serious that I feel like serving people is what I want to do with my life forever. Following God. Some of us are sitting here today and we feel like we don't have a purpose. We feel like we, we're, we're headed nowhere. It feels like that the crossroads of our life, instead of going in four directions, is going in 90 directions. And God is saying, if you want that to change, if you want consistency in that, if you want, to be, if you want clarity in that, he says, fall on your face and start to trust him again. And he'll bring clarity to your life. Going the way of God requires that we crucify the flesh. Galatians 5 and 24, Paul says, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lust. Paul's description of crucifying the flesh is no more than a major repentance that takes part in the life of the believer. Do you hear me? crucifying the flesh is saying, I am tired of this, and I need a change. Again, it is saying day after day that I am tired of the way that I'm living. I'm tired of the way life is going, and repeatedly you wake up every morning and you say, no flesh, not today. I'm going the way of God until, until you already have victory, but until you train it. Are you following me? You have victory. Don't get that mixed up. You have victory because of Jesus. But you have to train this flesh. Paul said that you have to beat it into subjection unto the obedience to Christ. Listen, so in other words, day in, day out, we have to wake up and make a conscious decision that I'm not going to be mad at my coworker. We have to make a conscious decision that when we are around the house doing life with our family, I'm not going to be mad at my spouse. I'm going to choose to say something nice instead of having the greatest comeback ever. Yeah. Now I'm in somebody's house. Major repentance. That's what is needed. Sincere repentance. It's what is needed. Can you imagine walking with Jesus and he's here all the time, he's with you all the time, he's walking with you all the time. He already knows what you're thinking, but you're trying to convince others that you're something that you're not. And Jesus is saying, you know better than that. It's 
time to get it right. If you want to walk with me, it's time to let that go. The Bible says to let go of the weight and the sin that so easily beset us. Who's been preaching that you could hold on to that garbage? God wants you to walk in victory. Listen, if you carry a weight around, how can you walk with Jesus? I don't want, listen, if somebody gave me the option of walking with my street clothes on, then carrying a weighted jacket with, with some weights around my legs and a waist, a belt with weights on it, and some of those guys, they come inside of the gym and, and they, they have the nurse to put a belt on and then put some, a chain on it, then put some weights between their legs and do dips. I'm like, that's impossible. How, do, how come we live our lives like that? Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. If I'm going to run this race, I want to ha- wear less as possible so I won't be weighted down. If you want to run this race for Jesus, you better start letting go of some friends, some places, and some things. Are you following me? Because God is going one way. The world is going another way. You're not, if you're going the way of God, you're definitely not going the way of the world. And in fact, to go the way of God is the polar opposite of the way of the world. And to go the way of God is going to take some crucifixion of your flesh. But to take some crucifixion of your flesh is going to take some pain and anxiety. And you have to learn to overcome through the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. It's him. It's his blood. I'm wrapping this thing up this morning. Paul's understanding of a crucifixion would have been short of something harsh and brutal. Once a person was on the cross, guys, there was no way of coming down. Are you following me? Once you're on that cross, it's it's over. There's no way of coming down. The cross was reserved for the worst of criminals in society. It was used to bring justice, but at the same time, it brought utter shame and disgrace as the criminals were often mocked and stripped of their clothing. Spiritual crucifixion is where the believer must learn to reject the old nature. Are you following me? This often results in mental and psychological pain more than physical pain and suffering as we turn our backs on our old self. That person who is struggling with addiction, the person who is trying to give up a bad habit. Have you ever had, like, uh, withdrawals? Yeah. Your habit may not have been cocaine or heroin, but we listed a lot of addictions. And no matter who you are and whatever your addiction, the person who's never touched drugs, touched alcohol, you still have addictions that God has had to deliver you from. And every single one of us have withdrawals at times. If, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if your addiction is, is, is gossip, get around a good conversation. Woo! It, this burns like fire. If your addiction is, is, is envy, you, you, a coveting, you can't, you, I mean, greed, you can't look at your neighbor's house without thinking about something that they have that you need. What is, whatever it may be, it has to be crucified. It has to be nailed to the cross and never to be brought back to life again. Stop taking it off the cross. Lastly, In order to go the way of God, you must be willing to die to self. When a criminal was nailed to the cross, they did not survive. There was no survivals. Survivors. Neither can our old nature be accepted anymore. You have to leave it there. No matter how bad it hurts, no matter how down it makes you feel, you have to leave it there. Expositor John Brown noted that true Christians don't succeed completely in destroying the sinful nature on earth, but they have fixed it to the cross, and they are determined to keep it there till it expire. Determined. No matter how it calls my name, 
I am determined. It, it's kind of like when Elisha was following Elijah and he was getting ready to receive that double portion. He didn't let anything hinder him. He's passing by the old prophets in the hills and they're calling out to his name. Elisha, Elisha, man, you might as well stop. You might as well not keep following him. You're not going to get anything. I'm paraphrasing what he's saying, what they're saying. But Elisha is looking up at them and saying, be quiet. And he's walking. Be quiet, and he keeps walking. Be quiet, and he keeps walking. Listen, what is it in your life that is hindering you from going the way of God? What is it that's in your life that's hindering you from following God wholeheartedly in the way that you know you should? The way of God means turning our backs on all that would hinder our process. I'm going to close with this. Luke 9, 57 through 62. As they went along the way, a man said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. In verse 59, it says, he said to another man, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury, to bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. Verse 61, yet another said, Lord, I will follow you. But let me first go and bid farewell to those at my house. Jesus said to him, no one who put his hand to the plow and looked back at the things, at, at things is fit for the kingdom of God. I'm going to read that last verse again because this is one of my most favorite verses and it kept me alive as I was a young Christian and walked with God. If you'll stand this morning. Verse 62, Jesus said to them, to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back, is fit for the kingdom of God. For some of us, that's a pretty harsh statement. In essence, what Jesus is saying is, if you're going to follow me, there's not one thing in your life that should hinder you. Are you understanding what I'm saying? I'm going to say it again. Jesus is saying, if you're going to follow him, there should not be one thing in your life that should take precedence over him. If you're going to follow the way of God, there's no room for excuses. The way of God is not for the faint heart, faint at heart, but it's for those who are willing to endure the pressures and the fires of life that will eventually make them to something usable by God. Not for the faint at heart. Not for the weak. It's definitely not for the strong. But it's for those who place their trust in God. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. <laughs> I'm thankful for his spirit. bow your heads today. I want you to just think for a moment. Think on your own life. Think of the, the crossroads of life. If there's anything that's in your path, Give it a name right now. And I want you to understand that you can't do it on your own. It's not by might, not by power, but by his spirit that you're going to overcome. There's a roadblock in some of our lives today, and God is wanting to set us free. And the only way it's going to be removed from your life is that you allow God to move it.
Living Hope Assembly of God. 